Who is our client? The first step in the hypothesis-based approach is to define and articulate the problem as the client sees it. But before we can dive into formulating the problem in detail, it's important to start with identifying who are the key stakeholders, where do their priorities lie, and what is their general attitude towards the project and our involvement. The term stakeholder, by the way, comes from the world of gambling, where a stake is the number of chips that a player has placed as a bet. Therefore, the more they have at stake, the more they have to gain or lose as a result of the outcome. So we need to ask, who is our main client or the key decision maker? Who are the other influencers? And what are their levels of support, involvement and power? We can then map these individuals within a stakeholder grid with their levels of involvement on one axis and their levels of support on the other. By doing this, we can group stakeholders into critics, individuals who are not heavily involved in our project but are not supportive of it, challengers who are directly involved and might challenge the project objectives, scope and how it's conducted, cheerleaders who can generate lots of goodwill around the project and champions who pave the way for us and are essential for the smooth running of the project. Remember, however, that these are only our initial perceptions and they're bound to change over time as we learn more about the individuals we're working with. What is the client context? Once we've decided on who's our main client, we can begin formulating the objective by asking a series of questions, such as, what does this client want to happen as a result of this assignment? How does this assignment fit with everything else that our client is trying to achieve? What fundamental question does the client want answered? And what are the deliverables for this assignment? Answers to these questions help us create the overriding objective for our assignment, which we will need to test and agree with key decision makers so there is no confusion or mismatch of expectations further down the line. You can articulate your understanding of the client context using S, C, Q. S is the situation. For example, let us say in your client sector there have been recent changes in regulation that have created opportunities for growth. C is the complication. However, these changes have also led to new competitors that have adopted aggressive pricing strategies. Q becomes the fundamental question, which might be, so how can your client address the threat posed by these newcomers whilst continuing to serve its traditional customer base. The question from our SCQ then becomes the overriding project objective, which is to develop an operational and financial plan to identify growth opportunities whilst addressing the threat posed by low-priced new competitors. What is a project scope? A scope defines the boundaries of an assignment and sets out the topics that we will need to investigate in order to address the project objective. Breaking the main problem into smaller components helps us and our team to prioritize and plan our efforts. We can use MISI as a guiding principle to group various topics and subtopics into a logically coherent structure. MISI stands for mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Mutually exclusive means that your topics for investigation do not overlap, so you're not duplicating your efforts. Collectively exhaustive means that the topics you have selected are all you need to investigate in order to solve the problem. Let's run through an example of how to use MISI. Let's say I'm going on a safari trip and I'm thinking about what to pack. So far, I have the following items. A hat, my boots, binoculars, insecticide, sun cream and my sunglasses, my camera, some shirts, my phone, my passport of course, trousers, my Kindle, toiletries, 
malaria tablets and my wallet. Now, is this list of items messy? No, it's messy. So how can I turn messy into messy? Well, I might group together some of the items, such as the hat, boots, possibly my sunglasses, my shirts and trousers. And I can call that group clothing and accessories. I can also see that my binoculars, camera, phone and Kindle belong together in a group that I'll call equipment and electronics. Next, I can create another group from insecticide, sun cream, toiletries and malaria tablets, which I'll call health and hygiene. Finally, that leaves my passport and wallet, which I'll put in a group called documents and travel essentials. That also reminds me that I can put my tickets, hotel reservations and insurance documents into that group too. The practice of putting things into MISI groups is essential because it makes your scope of work easier to remember, reduces inefficiencies and provides greater transparency for you, your colleagues and your client. It's also pretty useful when you're packing.